watching Channel 61, WQHS TV, Cleveland. Hi. Good morning, I'm Sharon Roman. Welcome to In Your Interest Weekend Edition. Welfare reform is the topic of conversation by both the state and federal government. And this morning, State Representative Jane Campbell is here to discuss this topic and the war on poverty. Good morning, it's nice to have you back once again. Good morning, it's good to be here. Representative Campbell, how difficult is it for you right now to divide yourself between Columbus, your presentations in Washington addressing this topic, and then dealing with the issue right here for the people who you represent? Actually, right now, what goes on in Washington will have an extraordinary effect on what's possible in the state of Ohio. So I look at it that my work in Washington and my work in Columbus are really one in the same. Uh, what we're trying to do in Washington as part of in my job as the National Conference of State Legislators president is to say to the Congress that we believe that the states need to be the laboratories of democracy, that we should in fact have the flexibility to try to meet the needs of our citizens as best we can. What happens in welfare reform is that we are getting judged not by whether we move children out of poverty, but instead by how well we fill forms out. When I went to Washington the week before last to testify to the United States Senate, I took with me the regulations that the federal government puts out that we are required to use for a person applying for aid. There are 4,000 pages of regulations with 2,000 pages of clarifications, which amount to a 36-page form with 770 questions. All the people who fill those forms out, all the people who read those forms to see if they're filled out right, are paid by the state and federal government. None of that money helps children, and none of it helps families. In fact, what I said to the, to the Congress is, let's set national standards. What is it that we're trying to do with our programs? I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that children don't live in poverty and that families have an opportunity to create economic independence. If we use that measure, instead of how many forms have you filled out, we will in fact require states to be much more creative in how we approach these programs. Because the program we have now was developed in the 30s for widows and orphans. It was a program for long-term dependents. Nobody ever expected those folks to work. Now, we have a different expectation. We want parents to support their children. We want absent parents to pay child support, and we want parents who are living with their children to not only care for their children, but to also participate in the economic workforce. So we need to completely revamp our program, and so that we start investing in the ability of children's parents to work and to provide support for their families. Is the federal government evaluating this, this issue greatly different than the individual state governments are, though? Well, see, one of the interesting things is that, on the one hand, the Congress is saying, we want to turn the program back to the states, we want the states to experiment. On the other hand, there, there are people in the Congress who are saying, but we want to provide a whole number of restrictions. We don't want you to provide support for unwed parents, or we don't want you to provide support for people with so many children, or we don't want, or we want to provide a two-year term limit, or this, this, this. Essentially, Governor Engler, who's the governor of Michigan, was also testifying to Congress the same week that I was there. And he said, conservative micromanagement of these programs is no better than liberal micromanagement. <laughs> in fact, Governor Engler's pretty well known for doing a lot of things that I would personally disagree with in, in his version of welfare reform in Michigan. But in fact, 
what he was saying is let's don't have the congress tell us what to do let's let the states experiment and then let's let's find out what works if we take the concept of having federal standards of moving children out of poverty helping families create economic independence and measure us by that standard then we could really find out does it work better to provide support for child care on a sliding scale uh, not requiring people to go on welfare first before they ever get support uh, let's help working families now um, if we provide support for health care so that low-income families that are working have access to health care insurance these are things that we could do to support working families that might be a real investment in welfare reform during the beginning of the year Newt Gingrich made some outlandish remarks as most Americans perceived it talking about putting these children in welfare and removing them from their parents that might not be the answer, but it did get the attention of the American public. Are you finding that there are drastic differences in the way the Republicans and the Democrats view this issue, though, of welfare? There are differences between the way a number of elected officials view this position. Some of it breaks down on partisan lines. Some of it breaks down on regional lines. Um, some of it breaks down based on what people's actual experience has been with people on welfare. The fewer people someone knows who've been on welfare, the easier it is to identify the welfare population as a single population. When the closer you are, the more you've actually met people who have used welfare, the more you understand that people go on welfare for a wide variety of reasons. Um, women who've been abandoned by their husbands or boyfriends, um, women who have been beaten and have moved try, trying to create safety for themselves and their children, um, women whose, whose husbands are not providing child support, whole families where they lived in a, um, a community where the principal um, industry was steel, but the steel companies have closed. And so you have people who, who grew up expecting that they were going to be able to have a manufacturing job that would provide a middle class a livelihood now realizing that they're going to have to go and get higher education, um, go to a community college to get technical skills, or even go to a four-year college. So there are a number of reasons. The other, of course, large population is teenagers who are having children well before they're able to care for those children and those those families are probably the most at risk for long-term dependency but there has been talk about putting restrictions on those teenagers because the number of unwed births have skyrocketed in the past 20 years some people say a you're under 18, your parents should be financially responsible. Do you see this as being a feasible way to diminish the number of teenagers who are making the choice to have children while they're still children? Well, there are a number of things that we've looked at in terms of teenage pregnancy. Ohio actually has one of the most successful programs in dealing with teenagers who have a child. and stopping the repeat pregnancies mm -hmm. or di diminishing it significantly. This is a program called the LEAP program, yeah. which is learning, earning, and parenting. Right. And this program was crafted when Governor Celeste was governor um, together with the legislature, where essentially what we provide is for that young mother, a person to be her advocate, to help her negotiate through the system, and it has really made a difference. We need to take a break. When we come back, I'd like to continue talking about LEAP and the requirements that are placed on these young mothers right now. Thank you. Stay with us. There's more ahead after this message. During the coming year, your neighbors will have their first baby. Your niece will celebrate her seventh birthday. 
and we'll all revel in that great American season called simply the holidays. They're special days for you and for the people special to you. So in your honor, why just give a present when you can give a piece of the future? When you give U.S. savings bonds, you give a gift to be treasured for years. You show you care today and for all those special days to come. Giving savings bonds is easy. Get them at your bank and ask for a U.S. savings bond gift certificate. So when people special to you celebrate days that are special to them, give the present that's a piece of the future. Give U.S. savings bonds. This morning we're talking about the current welfare system and some of the reasons it does not work with State Representative Jane Campbell. You were talking about the LEAP program that provides training for teenage mothers who have not finished school or who have not received appropriate training so that they can eventually support their families. But what is the criteria and what is the follow-up to ensure that these young mothers are making use of the programs that are available so that they will get off the system? Well, the LEAP program provides both a personal advocate and a financial incentive to stay in school and graduate from high school. Um, if you drop out of high school, you have $62 reduced from your, your ADC grant. And if you stay in school, you have $62 added. So there's a $120 differential. And when you're talking about a grant that is under $300, that is an enormous financial incentive. But the interesting thing is that what we found is that as important as the financial incentive is that advocate. So that there's some person who can stay with that young woman and help her try to think through her life, try to understand the responsibility she has with the child, how do you get child care, how do you put yourself in a position that you can actually earn money. This program has now been in effect for five years, and we have a comprehensive study that has shown that it has made a difference both in terms of um, moving those young women from welfare dependency and providing an opportunity for them to actually graduate from high school. Now, one of the interesting things is we looked in, the, in another study, we looked at a program that is available to all um, all young women who have children, um, regardless of whether they're on welfare or not, called the GRADS program, mm -hmm. which is graduation reality and dual skills <laughs> learning. Um, and that does not deal with the financing, it just deals with having the individual advocate. And that was just as successful as the LEAP program. That what we've learned is when you really talk to young women who have children too early, it's an awful lot of them do it because they want somebody to love mm -hmm. them. They have so little long-term stability in their life of someone who is actually going to be there for them. Uh, that, And they don't know. I mean, those of us who have children know that. Oh, how much work you know, is involved. It's an extraordinary amount of work. Mm -hmm. There are piles of laundry yes. before you get to that love, um, or they come with the love, right. shall we say. And it's, it creates a two-generation tragedy when a very young person has a baby wanting someone to love them because they don't have the resources to care for that child and the child is going to come with without the kind of resources that the baby needs so what we try to do is we're trying to intervene and build the support in that family see now one of the places where I would really part company with uh, Speaker Gingrich is you know, when he said, well, we'll just take these children away from these families and put them in orphanages, because even a young child, you know, a, I would call a young child, a teenager who has a child, they need an extraordinary amount of support, but still, they have a powerful bond with that baby. Yes. And there are, you know, really, you cannot, no government program can provide parental love. We have got to be able to provide, help parents be better parents. 
it's like when we're talking about child care and quality of child care i have always argued that we ought to invest in information and referral services so that we can help parents evaluate child care because we will never accomplish with inspectors what parents can do i mean we have inspectors in every child care center first thing in the morning and at the end of the day and there's nobody who cares about your kids more than you do how true and so we've got to make sure that we teach parents how to stand up for their own rights and for the rights of their children representative campbell when you talk about advocates though who do you recommend would be the best advocate for these teenage mothers their own parents or someone outside of the family circle well you really need both your own parents and someone outside the family circle it, everything we know about teenagers and as they try to establish their own independence they rebel they, they, they'll rebel against their home you know their home life and the question is what's out there when they when they turn if they turn only to their peers and there's not a lot of strength in those peers then you've got a really big problem um, and there's not a lot of factuality from their peers either because they don't know no question about it and part of part of what you think about is the whole stitching together the fabric of our community um, i think it's important that we look not only to government to try to address this problem but look to our churches um, i know when i was a young person i was very involved in the church youth group and that provided for me an opportunity there were different adults that you could talk to um, there were you know different experiences people who you had opportunities to learn from and it was a community and there's an awful lot of things that we've lost as people have moved away from some of those things and we ought to look again at our own involvement with with our own churches are we providing what what we need to provide for the young people in our community in 1986 you were on the governor's task force for teenage sex sexuality and pregnancy has much changed since 1986 unfortunately not enough has changed um, as a matter of fact if you look at the issue of children in poverty in 1970 in the state of ohio there were about 10 percent of our children were living in poverty by the time we did the 1990 census 18 percent of the children were living in poverty now a part of that is because of the change in the economy in the state of Ohio. As we've lost manufacturing jobs, replaced those with service jobs, yes, there are more jobs, but those jobs don't generate mm -hmm. uh, the kind of income for a family that the manufacturing jobs had, had generated. And so we need to recognize that part of the real issue with teenage pregnancy consistently was young people who couldn't foresee for themselves an economically secure future and we need to take a look at what kind of education is really going to be required for people to be able to provide an economically secure future no longer are we talking about a high school education right. being the end the end point and in fact, we're now talking about people having a number of different careers during, mm -hmm. during their time. working life. And so the role of community colleges becomes an extraordinarily important function, not just for the 19-year-olds who are graduating from high school, but for someone who's 27 and needs to get additional skills, someone who's 52 and needs to get additional skills. And, some of the creativity that has gone on with our community college here is really terrific. We need to begin looking at the whole forest and not just the trees in the immediate now is That's what you're right. saying. We need to take another quick break. We'll have more In Your Interest Weekend Edition in just a moment. For millions of years, they ruled the earth, and then they vanished. What really caused the dinosaurs to become extinct? 
Was it a giant asteroid crashing to Earth? Was it massive volcanoes erupting around the world? Was it a sudden change in climate? Or was it that they just weren't financially prepared to live out their later years? How can you avoid the dinosaur's fate? By making U.S. savings bonds part of your retirement savings program. Ask your banker or employer. U.S. savings bonds, the safe and easy way to make sure you're financially prepared for your later years. We're back with In Your Interest Weekend Edition and our guest, State Representative Jane Campbell from Cleveland, who served as the House Assistant Minority Leader and the President of the National Conference of State Legislators. President, or rather, uh, Governor Voinovich and other governors, yes, I know he is, you're right, are talking about controlling their own states when it comes to welfare reform. What has Governor Voinovich proposed so far? What would he like to do to turn the cycle around here in the state of Ohio? Well, we've actually been, been working with the governor when we think he's right and uh, challenging the governor when we, when we think he has gone in a direction that's not supportable. More specifically. But particularly, one of the things we've done that really is a cooperative effort is providing a significant increase in Head Start. Um, so that we're investing in our next generation so that we're actually going to be able to provide education. One of the areas where we've had a significant conflict is about providing support for working families for child care. Um, the governor um, has provided very limited support for working families and in fact in the last budget cut back the support for working families so we're always working on trying to invest in those families that do play by the rules and are working but because they're only earning six dollars and fifty cents an hour or you know maybe six seventy five mm -hmm. they don't have enough money to provide for child care for their children um, we're right now in the process of doing budget negotiations and we have just received a proposal from the governor that we haven't yet seen in written form. So we're working from press releases trying to understand what the proposal is and we can't quite be sure. Um, there are some good things in it. There's an expansion of the ability of welfare recipients to work and preserve their earnings as, a, uh, as they try to move off welfare. One of the um, significant areas of discussion right now is something called Ohio Care. Um, the governor has proposed that we institute managed health care for the traditional welfare recipients and use the savings to expand the base of people who are covered um, in the health care system. And that is something that we've been very supportive of. Now, if I were to run the program my own way, I would invest those savings in providing expanded coverage for families with children. Mm -hmm. um, because for roughly the same amount of money, you could expand the program so that there was health insurance for all families with children up to about 200% of poverty, which is about $22,000 a year for a family of three. The governor has chosen instead to use those savings to expand health care coverage for single people and families without children who are living at 100% of poverty, roughly about $12,000 for a family mm -hmm. of three. Um, it's a policy choice. I would, I would choose to invest in the children, but he has chosen to do it in this other way. But we're trying to understand what the concept is with Ohio Care and see um, if, in fact, that's something that we can establish and build upon. One of the key discussions between Columbus and Washington is whether welfare um, whether it's called welfare or whatever kind of support for, for poor children is provided is an entitlement as opposed to a specific dollar figure that the states have to distribute. One of the reasons it matters so much that it pre be preserved as an entitlement, which means something that's available to every poor child, um, is because of the fluctuations in the economy. 
Um, if we had a program that was not an entitlement, and we went through the kind of economic turmoil that we went through in the 80s, the people who would be most hurt would be those families who had been working, you know, like in Youngstown, working yeah, at the steel, steel mills, mills. Mm -hmm. um, and had basically created a middle-class lifestyle, thought they were going to be able to continue to do that, and suddenly, you know, thousands of jobs Taken were lost all at once. And if we had a set dollar figure, we could never have provided uh, financial resources for those families without some some help from the federal government. So that's a that's a debate that we're having. Um, how realistic is it, though, to put limitations on welfare coverage? Some people have speculated that two years or five years should be the mark, and after that point, someone is responsible for moving on on their own. You talk about people taking minimum wage jobs, and we know that many women, especially with children, fall back on welfare because health care is provided. But if we limited the health care and the welfare, would that put the pressure on individuals to take the responsibility for continually improving their life? Or do you feel that this would not work effectively? Well, there, there's a real appeal to having uh, welfare be a short-term leg up rather than a long-term dependency program. Um, it's difficult to actually apply that. Um, when you look at it in practice. Personally, I don't think that people should be even given two years not to be involved in something right. that's going to improve their economic life, their economic um, opportunities. And their self-esteem um, for that matter. Their self-esteem and the whole range. But, for example, if someone falls into welfare and they are trying to create an economically secure future, it may be the best thing that they could do to go to college. You can't do college in four years. Um, if someone is actually in college, attending, um, getting, you know, passing grades, and they're willing to live at the welfare subsistence level during those four years in order to make that investment in their education, I think we ought to let them do it. Um, it's the people who the idea that people have is that people are on welfare and they're not really trying to improve their lot. That I think is a terrible frustration to the public. I think in actuality that's a very small group of mm -hmm. people. In, in Cuyahoga County, a year and a half ago, we, did a, we took a look at the jobs program, which now in Ohio you're required, if your children are three years or older, you're required to participate in the jobs program where you get assessed and you're responsible for being in training, uh, being in a job, uh, job search program, trying to find yourself a job. And we found out that in Cuyahoga County alone, there were over 10,000 people who had signed up for the jobs program. They had been assessed. They were anxious to participate in a training program, but we'd run out of money to pay for job oh. training. And so they were as frustrated as the public was. They don't like being on welfare. They want out. Mm -hmm. They want to get a job. Um, they want to take care of their family. There's no easy solution to the problem. I thank you so much for being with us this morning, Representative Campbell. Thank you. to your kids about drugs. Make an appointment. Yo, Mom, what's up? You're watching Channel 61, WQHS-TV, Cleveland. And some price for something like that. So it's a great alternative, a great alternative to either the tanzanite or the sapphire.
at a very affordable price in 14 karat gold. 1-800-284-3200 is the number to dial. We'll take this one off the screen in about a minute. A lot of fantastic opportunities at terrific prices today. We're going to continue to move at a very rapid pace here all the way up until the hour of 11 o'clock Eastern Time at 8 a.m. Pacific Time. And that's, of course, as I mentioned, when we will have the fashion show commencing.